Okay, time to bring you up to speed on the CNC build. In this video we're covering mostly the mounting of the Z-axis and the routing and tensioning for the belts. Uh, I do already have it up and running, at least in a basic sense. I can uh, plug in G-code manually to Linux CNC and then draw some simple squares. Uh, those right there were done simply using a Sharpie that I taped on the Z-axis. Nothing fancy in the slightest, but it did work pretty well. Because when I tell you it's six inches long, I ain't lying. Now mounting the Z-axis was pretty easy because there's already a bunch of pilot holes on the back here that just came, you know, from it already. Uh, I bought this on eBay. It was done by some guy who owns a CNC mill. So those holes are already there and accurate. And I just opened them up a bit to make them uh, clearance holes for 10 gauge machine screws. Then I drilled and tapped a few matching holes on the back of the carriage roller here. And again, because these pilot holes were all accurately spaced, that was, uh, you know, easy to copy onto here, just using some graph paper and automatic center punch. Now the uh, axis is currently spaced off the back of this roller using a handful of washers. Um, just something to keep it out of the way of the head of one of the carriage bolts down there. So you can see better on this guy. There's uh, one more carriage bolt on the bottom that holds uh, one last bearing to keep the whole thing from rocking too much. So. With that there, you gotta have something lifting this off so you can you know, bypass that. Um, and then that'll let me use any set of the holes in the back for mounting this into the uh, holes I drilled and tapped. I have since gone and made a slightly fancier spacer on my 3D printer, and that's to make it you know, a bit more easy uh, to install later, because dealing with all those washers is a little bit futzy. But I have tried throughout this build to make uh, you know, as few things as possible on the 3D printer. At least make the things I do create, uh, you know, not terribly unique and difficult to mimic otherwise. Because I want the whole build to be something that you can just watch the videos and then copy it effectively verbatim without having a 3D printer. I'm lucky enough to already have one here in my shop. Uh, that's a Lulzbot Mini, which I got maybe three years ago. Uh, I've had it for, you know, a while and definitely gotten some use out of it. And it was a good intro to basic CNC stuff. Uh, but it was also like a $1,300 machine. And <laughs> this whole table is going to cost less than $1,300 to build. So I don't want you to buy a tool that, you know, costs more than the thing you're trying to build. That's just ridiculous. So I've made a few things on here, but none of them are all that crazy. You know, like here's a shim, not much at all. This was the uh, cutting template I had shown before for making these corner brackets. Just then I could uh, run my plasma torch out around the outside of it manually to cut these guys. Uh, here I have a slightly improved version of uh, a drill marking uh, template. So this will slide on a piece of two inch tube like that. And then you can center punch whichever holes you want. If you're at the end of the tube, it's easy to slide it all the way down to the very end and then get the ends flush. And you know, the first few inches then you can mark and drill easily. If you're going further in, what I've done uh, is use a combination square and its ruler to make kind of a hard stop that you can put on the end of the tube and then just slide this up until it bumps in the ruler. And then lastly, we have this slot cutting jig I made for making uh, the slots across from these belt tensioners. So I mentioned before that uh, on these guys that align the axes, I did not bother you know making a proper jig and they came out kind of sloppy. So for the next set, I uh, put in the time and effort and maybe one that actually, you know, does a much better job. Let's see if I can, can't really show you cause it's in the way, but it's much, much cleaner. So for this, I just drop some sort of spacer on the tube here and then drop this on top of that. And then can trace around the inside of this hole with the uh, torch tip on my plasma. And all this little spacer does is keep the uh, plastic from being in direct contact with the steel and that makes it last a little bit longer before it melts <laughs> And when it does melt, you know, you've printed it so you can always make another one easily enough uh, Now you can see here. I did hack this guy apart a little bit used to have uh, both sides You know completely uh, flush all the way down But I couldn't use that on this axis here. Thanks to these tabs that were welted on uh, They just got in the way so cutting from Mr. Clarence made up for that Anyway, back to the Z-axis. You might be wondering, why is my gantry so high up? It means I have to mount the Z-axis so it hangs low and then still lift up the surface that I'm trying to draw on. Well, 
that's mostly to leave room for future improvements. You know, with eight inches between the top of the table here and the bottom of the gantry there, I have room to later uh, put things like a tube cutter or whatever the hell else I think of. If I made the gantry lower, then I wouldn't necessarily have that option. So it's future proofing. Uh, another thing is there's a big difference between a pen like that and my plasma torch. Okay, <laughs> That is a long ass tool. It has a lot of reach. So really that will be able to reach the workpiece no matter how I have that mounted. Um, your situation might be different if you're using a handheld torch on your CNC machine. Right, if you're grabbing one like this here and going to cobble together some mount for that, uh, you might not have the luxury of having the reach you know, from your gantry. So you might need to make your gantry lower. Just think about that before you do the whole build and then you know, find out you can't actually reach the, uh, the work piece you're trying to cut. But anyway, with the ability to pick whichever mounting holes I'm using here, you know, I'm not, not too worried. I'll be able to get, get down to where the work is just fine. And I should have plenty of room up here for stuff later on. Uh, for reference, I've read uh, most builds leave between 6 and 10 inches of space, and then mine is 8. So, right there in the middle. Now, uh, next steps on here are to make some sort of mount for a pen. Just something simple, just to do some more testing. I, you know, I've already done those basic drawing shapes. I want to do some more just to see how the machine is running before I throw a torch on it. Uh, <laughs> we're getting to the point now where things can... Uh, get dangerous, you know, for real. Like, if you put a torch in here, that thing draws 10 kilowatts when you run it on max. Uh, you know, it, it could uh, cause some harm if you're not sure that things are running properly. So while I'm eager to see this thing get done, I also want to take my time and not rush it. Hopefully, within two weeks, I think that's reasonable. I can get something, you know, cut for real, and that would be great. But if it takes longer, I'm also not, you know, not too worried. Um, but yeah, make a pen mount first, do some more drawings, and then also make a torch mount. Uh, I probably will be 3D printing those parts, but again, they're kind of specialized to what you're trying to mount. So the parts I make won't be the parts you need anyway, unless you happen to have the same uh, hypertherm torch that I'm using, you know. And worst case scenario, if you need to mock up something for uh, mounting your torch, uh, poor man's machining operation, right, it's just getting a, a block of oak hardwood and a pocket knife. <laughs> and there's nothing you can't make with that. And the first thing you do when your CNC machine is up and running is use the machine to upgrade the machine. But, you know, for basic stuff, hardwood actually does pretty well. In fact, uh... No, here? Yeah. Got some, uh... V-blocks I've been using on my uh, cold cut saw since I bought it. They're just a scrap of walnut I laying around. And they do great. Uh, at some point when I have a mill, I'll get like a, a block of aluminum and make, you know, nice stuff that way. But for uh, the quick and dirty, you know, I had a table saw and a scrap of walnut, and that did the job just fine. Uh, let's see. So one other thing with the mounting here, yeah, is uh, the holes in the back. Perfectly fine. You know, they're spaced at uh, even fractional of an inch increments that made sense. On the front here... It's not that way. <laughs> These two holes are spaced two inches apart on the money. Okay. These ones down here seem to be 2.1, which I don't get. Doesn't come out to like a metric hole number either. It just seems to be something funny. And then these holes are also counterboard, which doesn't make sense. Because if you're trying to mount something to this face, why would you put the counterbore on the thing on the back? <laughs> Anyway, what I'm getting at here is that there is uh, apparently plenty of room in the DIY CNC parts market for improvement. So stay tuned and see if I myself jump in on that, because stuff like this is it's just stupid. Speaking of stupid, I've mentioned these carriage rollers a few times and how awful the instructions that came with them were. And sure enough, the uh, recommended belt riding they included was not possible, because there simply was not enough space underneath the carriage roller to have the idlers and the belts and get the belt through in the way they suggested. So here's what I have instead. Uh, each carriage roller has two idlers and the pulley, and the idlers themselves are just a pair of uh, 608 skateboard bearings pushed side by side. Uh, those 608 bearings are seven millimeters wide and the belt is 15, so it is a little bit narrow. And that's part of why I have these uh, top hat shapes that I 3D printed. 
uh, both to space it out and kind of act as a uh, bumper to keep the belt from possibly rolling off the pulleys. Now, what provides a majority of uh, you know keeping the belt aligned is just having you know the height of the pulleys here, the idlers, and the anchors at the end, you know, all in the same line. Uh, but having a backup like a washer or something there doesn't hurt either. Now, with the uh, idlers pulled all the way forward and the pulley pushed all the way back, we get about a third of the pulley engaging on the belt. And I've read that a quarter or so is the minimum recommended amount of engagement, so a third is passable. It'd be ideal to have like the belt actually wrap around it in some way and get like half or three quarters. That way there's just better uh, power transfer. But again, with limited space, this is the best we can do. Taking a closer look at the belt itself, this is a 3M HTD profile belt which has a curvilinear tooth shape. If that would focus. Hmm. No, nope, there we go. Yeah. Okay, no. Nope. <laughs> well, anyway, rather than being a triangular or trapezoidal shape like you might be used to, it has more of a wavy profile. And according to the marketing wank on 3M's website, that makes it better for linear positioning, which is exactly what we have here. Uh, I also got this belt because it seems like it'll be pretty robust. You know, it's just on the bigger side of things with a three millimeter pitch, 50 millimeter width, and a steel cable running through it. That should make it pretty resistant to having the teeth either shear off or the cable stretch or anything like that. In fact, I'd anticipate for the size of gantry we have uh, and the fact that we are running a plasma, this is probably overkill. Uh, but there ain't no kill like overkill, so, you know, it should work. Uh, it is important to remember that when you're running a plasma, you don't have to deal with uh, any cutting forces, right? Your uh, torch tip just skates over the workpiece, and there's no uh, pushback from having to like drag an end, end mill or a you know router bit or anything like that through the workpiece the way you'd have on a mill or a router. So on those machines, you need a lead screw to be able to move the gantry you know through the work. But here, I think a belt will be just fine. In fact, belts are pretty common on other CNC machines, uh, specifically 3D printers. <laughs> Right, we're there, they use a, a much smaller uh, GT2 profile belt, which I wouldn't ever use on this guy just due to the size of it. Um, but 3D printers also have a tool head that has no cutting forces to go through because it, again, glides over the work as it ejects the, uh, the molten plastic onto the part you're making. Uh, and last but not least, this belt uh, was a good choice because it was easy to source. <laughs> That's one important consideration when you're coming up with the design, you know, you, you pick these certain parts, well, can I find the parts I want to use, right? Like what's available without, uh, you know, paying some extravagant price for a uh, not commonly used item, right? The more common a component is, the cheaper it gets and the easier it gets to be to use it in other stuff too. That's why <laughs> these, uh, you know, rollers here are using skateboard bearings. And why I'm using skateboard bearings here? Because they're abundant and that makes them cost effective. These are the belt tensioners. I made six of these, uh, one for each end of each axis. And now that I've made them, I'm not sure to recommend doing this design verbatim because it was a bit difficult to work with and kind of overly complicated. But it does have one advantage over every other design and that's that I went and did it, right? Rather than sitting on my hands and coming up with alternatives ad nauseum and worrying about is this the best solution or what, I just went and did it, and that counts for a lot. So the gist of it is, we have a piece of two by two that moves along a slot I cut in each rail. And uh, then there's a clamp here on the front. The clamp is uh, kind of a style I copied off a bunch of 3D printers, where we have the uh, belt coming through, wrapping around, and then clamping in to itself. So this round stock here is, I think, a uh, half inch round stock spaced an eighth of an inch off the two by two. I did that just by uh, putting some flat bar in there, tack welding it with the MIG welder, and then coming in and filling it in with a whole lot of weld. So this whole gap is just filled with weld bead, D you know, whatever. And then uh, the belt comes in, wraps around, and is clamped down by this piece of flat bar. But it's not so much the pressure exerted by these socket cap screws as it is the teeth engaging on the belt. So even if these socket cap screws are pretty loose, as long as these teeth mesh, you know, even halfway, the belt isn't going to slip. 
And that's a good thing because uh, it means we can leave this somewhat loose while we're applying tension to the block. And then that will help us get uh, everything drawn, taut, and aligned at the same time. It'll pull the rest of the slack out of the belt here and it'll let us get this part uh, high enough so that it is in line with everything, everything else. Like you might notice that this uh, piece of round stock is pretty long and the whole block here is situated higher than the rail, you know, by a whole inch. And that's because with the uh, way the pulley comes down from this carriage roller, it's actually situated pretty high in relation to this rail. So uh, the long piece of round stock gives us, you know, some leeway here and gets this whole uh, thing aligned with the center of the top half of the rail. Now, uh, as for how this slides in the slot, I cut one of them into uh, each rail here. And again, with uh, tight quarters, there's a couple of socket cap screws in here and then some nuts back in there. In the future, I'll be uh, drilling some extra holes to make it easier to uh, tighten these down by feeding the socket cap screws in that way. And then I can feed the uh, Allen key in after them. Uh, let's see. Then the uh, piece of steel here, this piece of one by one, it isn't clamping down to anything. It's just more of a bearing surface to help with the process of tensioning and to keep uh, you know, the angles here correct. Because uh, nothing was you know, ensuring that this piece of round stock would be welded in line with the edge of this piece of two by two, right? Just kind of eyeballing it and tacking it and hoping that it's mostly aligned. In fact, here you can see it's okay, but it's not a perfect job. So by having uh, some oversized holes here, this piece of one by one, I can adjust the angle of this whole block in relation to the rail and then use this as a bearing surface against the rail and clamp it all down tight. And that way, uh, you know, this thing isn't, you know, cantered over like five degrees or anything like that, that would make the uh, belt not wrap around smoothly. And one other point with uh, close quarters, you might notice that all these guys are a little bit short too. They don't come down, uh, you know, as far as the rail does. I did that because on the Y axis, we also have these bolts to account for, which, uh, you know, go in the tabs actually hold the gantry in place. So that was another close call, uh, almost not make it there. Back in the future, I might come back and grind that out a little bit next time I have this thing, thing disassembled, just to make it uh, easier to fit the wrench in. And then lastly, the uh, tensioning tool that I used to actually bring these things taut. <sighs> like I said, this whole part was rather complicated. So the way this works, you have this bolt on a piece of inch and a half square tube, and I welded a nut on there. So you can clamp it beside this from top and bottom with some C-clamps and use a socket to turn this bolt and then draw this piece out. Now when you're doing this, you gotta remember, you basically have the, uh, the clamp pressure fighting the belt tension. So if the clamps aren't clamped down very hard, as you tighten this bolt, it'll just push this block back <laughs> as opposed to pushing this block forward. So you gotta watch as you're doing that and see which one's moving and clamp down you know, the clamps hard enough that this is the block that moves. Luckily, we don't need that much tension on the belt, right? Like this is, uh, you know, it's got some, but it's not, not crazy amounts. And I found it easiest to tension it by uh, locking down the uh, blocks on the far end and pushing the gantry all the way back to the far end. That way, uh, most of the belt was on one side of the pulley and I was, you know, had a pretty easy time pulling it pretty taut. Then wrap this around, uh, get the uh, flat bar here, holding it loosely in place, get everything aligned, uh, apply this guy for the tension. And then while those clamps are still in place, begin securing all the nuts and bolts. And then finally the clamps and this guy could come off. <sighs> yeah. Not, uh, not the easiest thing in the world, but at least it's done. Oh, and before I forget, I've got uh, all the wiring redone too. Uh, you know, just dangling here on this piece of plywood, bolted in right there. Uh, I got four drivers, two power supplies, a whole mess of wires, and uh, even some uncovered terminal blocks. Well, I'll have 120 volts AC coming in. <laughs> what was that I said about uh, safety before? Eh. Yeah.